Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson our topic is discoveries. Let's examine a short little game that involves a whole bunch of them. This is how the game started out. e4, one of the most common and most natural moves on the first move which immediately occupies the center and opens up diagonals for white's light squared bishop as well as queen. Black responded with the so-called Peart's defense by playing d6, which is a bit less popular than playing e5 on move 1 or c5. White responds, being allowed, to occupy the center with a second pawn. Excellent choice. Generally, if one side can have both pawns in the center, that's a good thing. Black responded, developing further with the knight and immediately challenging one of the white center pawns. To push it forward immediately would not be a great idea because black immediately would exchange the pawns, then exchange the queens, which already in itself would be a success for black because it would mean that a white king would no longer castle ever in this game. On top of that, black right now would play knight g4 and immediately create a fork, a double attack on two white pawns, and white could only protect one of them at a time. Let's go back all the way. So we said the game started with e4 d6, d4 knight f6 and as we've seen pushing the pawn forward right now to e5 is not the greatest idea. The best move is, which white continued with, is to develop the knight to c3 and protect the pawn at the same time. Generally in this opening black aims to develop the bishop to the side to g7. Therefore play g6 and in this game white played ambitiously putting a third pawn to control the center. It's kind of a matter of taste which setup you choose in the various openings but this certainly is considered an ambitious way to play for white. Ambitious usually involves somewhat risky as well although as we shall see in this game black didn't get to that point where white would have had to fear. Black continued with bishop g7 developing, getting ready to castle on the king side. And so did white by playing knight f3, of course the best square for the knight because from f3 the knight controls two important center squares, d4 and d5. And black was ready to castle and white is ready to continue to develop bishop d3 also about ready to castle. And in this position black's two main moves are to develop the knight to c6 or even in many games in this case an exception the knight may go to a6 as well. Other reasonable moves here are to push the c-pawn up one or two squares. Black instead developed the knight to a natural square, we have to admit. But this gives white the opportunity to immediately start pushing back the black knight. And here black made a mistake that caused a lot of trouble in the near future. Black should have retreated the knight right away back to e8. Instead black captured first the pawn and as we shall see this led to some serious trouble soon. White captured back with the d-pawn and now the knight had not much choice but again to retreat back to e8. White castled and black played knight b6 trying to open up the diagonal of the light squared bishop to get into the game, to develop. 
and white continued with bishop to e3. So as we can see, white has completed the development, all the minor pieces are beautifully centralized, the king has already castled, and white has some space advantage. Space advantage usually we define by how far our pawns are pushed ahead. Of course, we're only talking about pawns that are nicely protected and not in any danger of getting lost. In this case, the fact that, for example, the e5 and f4 pawns are more advanced than their counterpart for black on e7 and f7, it is important because those two white pawns limit greatly the mobility of black's bishop on g7. So that is oftentimes the reason why we're trying to gain space, in order to limit the mobility of the opponent's pieces, as well as to enhance the mobility of our own pieces. Right now, if black would try to play knight d5 to exchange some pieces, then white would not trade right away, but would have a nice little combination by playing bishop g6. And this is the first discovery that we're seeing in this example, in this lesson. If now black recaptures on g6, then white can safely capture the black knight on d5 and simply walk out of the deal with an extra pawn. Black most likely foresaw this danger and therefore rather play the preparatory move by playing c6. Now already black would safely try moving the knight to d5 because the black pawn from c6 also guards that square. And this is a key moment of this game where white came up with a very tricky and dangerous idea. The white knight moved to g5. It looks like a harmless looking move with no particular threat. However, things are not quite as simple as they seem. In fact, white does have a threat. And black apparently haven't noticed what that threat is. At this stage, black should have moved his queen to c7 to move it away from an unprotected square. Black made a mistake and immediately pushed the pawn to h6. Well, why is this a problem? It attacks the knight and if the knight has to retreat, that's certainly some progress for black. Quite amazingly, the knight does not need to move backwards. The knight can continue moving forward. Namely, moving to h7. What an unexpected move this is. And of course, at the same time, it tells us that if black wouldn't have had played h6, that was white's threat actually, to capture on h7. An additional idea that white could have had here against some moves that stop the knight h7 threat is to get the queen over to h4 and try to attack that way. So after h6, knight h7, the point is that if now the black king captures the knight, then the bishop captures on g6 and voila! Here comes the discovery, the black queen will be lost after black responds to the check by the bishop. But actually, black was quite resourceful and came up with some very interesting saving ideas after knight h7. Black responded by playing knight to d5 right now. And the idea is to attack white's bishop on e3, on one hand. On the other hand, the idea is that this move closes up the d-file and therefore there is no immediate discovery threat. So, in other words, if the white knight right now captures the rook on f8, 
Then the black knight captures on e3 a bishop, attacks the white queen, attacks the white rook, and of course the white knight on f8 is not gonna run anywhere because all its squares are protected by one of the black pieces. So the, the most valuable piece of white need to move, queen e2, and then knight captures the rook, and black actually will come out a piece ahead on this deal. So this looks like not a good thing from white's point of view. Going back to knight d5, the other most logical thing to do is to simply exchange these knights, as white actually did in the game, and the idea is that if black recaptures on d5, then white would simply capture the rook on f8. By the way, it's important to note that the black rook on f8 has been trapped. So if black will not succeed to get rid of that knight on h7, then sooner or later the knight will capture that rook and white will win an exchange. And this is what exactly that trick was from black's point of view to now not capture the knight on d5 but the one on h7. So now we're still having material balance and the point is that because the white knight is on d5 that is why white right now cannot use that same idea of discovery by bishop capturing on g6 and then capturing the queen on d8. Obviously, white could not jump over his own knight on d5 and therefore this combination right now wouldn't work. However, if white would succeed to forcefully get rid of that knight on d5 while maintaining the idea of the discovery, that could lead to material gain. And indeed, white can accomplish that. However, white needs to pay close attention on how to achieve that. For example, trying it by playing knight f6 check would not work. It would work if the pawn would capture it, which looks like the most natural move, because then, after bishop g6, kind of the same way as we've seen earlier, white will win black's queen. The problem is that black also has an option to capture this knight with the knight. And what happens now? What is the difference? The difference is that all of a sudden the black rook is protecting the queen and therefore it is black who wins material, not white. Let's go back, just one move, and look at this position again. Well, if the knight would need to retreat, that certainly would give black sufficient time to get developed and to make sure that the black queen will not remain on an unprotected square, allowing the discovery. However, there is a good way to continue here. Unlike knight f6, which didn't work, if white tries the same idea from the other side of the board, that actually leads to success. And that smart move is to play knight b6. Right now, the black rook on a8 is hanging, and hopefully you can figure out what is white's plan if the pawn would capture the knight. Well, I hope you guessed right. If pawn takes knight, then the bishop captures on g6, and immediately we created a discovery, and the black queen would be lost. So therefore, black came up with another tricky and resourceful way to continue the fight. Again, if the rook would move to b8, nothing would change, white again would sack the bishop on g6, and then capture the queen. And, fortunately for white, the queen cannot capture the knight on b6, as the white dark squared bishop is also controlling that square. The resourceful idea that black had was 
to play bishop g4. That's another nice move from black's perspective, as now black connected the rook with the queen, so therefore the bishop g6 move doesn't really work. And it also attacked the white queen. But the bishop on g4 is not protected, so therefore white is happy to capture that bishop. And now finally black also got a time to capture the white knight on b6. Now interestingly, after all these combinations and pieces hanging and everything, we're back to a normal position with material balance. And there is no direct way to kind of force a checkmate. However, white's attack actually is devastating. Now we have to kind of change a little bit because all those discoveries are history. The focus now is all of a sudden on a kingside attack. And how can white make that happen? Well, when we're trying to attack, generally the most effective way to make progress is to open either files or diagonals, or of course in some cases both, against the opponent's king. So for example, if your opponent would have castled to the queen side, then generally your best bet is trying to open the B or the C files. What does it mean, opening a file? Opening a file means to try to get pawns out of that file. Oftentimes, we're even willing to sacrifice a pawn to achieve that. But more often, we rather just try to create a trade between our pawn and our opponent's pawn in order to open a diagonal or a file. And that's exactly the case here, what we're seeing. White, with their next move, playing f5, are trying to remove from the board the white f-pawn, which would open up to full power the white rook on f1, and, of course, if the g6-pawn will be traded for white's f5-pawn, then the white bishop on d3 in combination with the white queen will be super dangerous and powerful. For example, if the pawn would capture on f5, queen f5, black would get immediately checkmated with queen h7. So naturally that is out of question. However, the problem is that now white has a threefold attack on black's weak point on g6 because the bishop from d3 indirectly supports that attack. After the pawn from f5 captures on g6, then already we can see that that bishop will also target that very same square. The other problem that black has is that if they push through by playing g5, yet another discovery idea comes into the game. By playing f6 right now, White opens up the diagonal of the bishop to check the black king and at the same time attacks black's bishop on g7. So therefore black could not avoid losing a bishop as black needs to lose some time in moving the king out of the check and by that time the white pawn will capture the bishop. So let's go back to the position after f5 when black continued by playing bishop takes e5. Well, for a moment black is a pawn up, however, that moment will not last very long, and of course, even if they would, that pawn wouldn't matter too much, because white already has a very dangerous attack against the black king, with both white bishops pointing in the direction of the black king, with the f rook on f1 ideally positioned for the upcoming opening of the f-file and the white queen is also excellently positioned on the king side supporting white's attack. White continued by capturing on g6 with a check. Of course it's uh, 
not hard to understand why black cannot capture back on g6. On one hand it would open up the f file and then lose the rook on f8 and on the second hand even more importantly after fg6 white would be ready to checkmate in just two moves after the simple queen takes pawn on g6 and after king h8 white would have a pleasant choice of two different checkmates one with the bishop and queen queen h7 or alternatively just rook takes rook and again it's a checkmate Let's go back to the position after fg6 and black didn't give up that easily but moved the king instead back to the corner. So for the time being we are back in material equality. The problem is that black is about to lose more material or even get checkmated. White took on f7 so now again white is a pawn up and the black king is getting in a more and more vulnerable situation. If it was white's turn again, white could easily just double up the queen and the bishop on the b1h7 diagonal and create checkmate threat on h7. Therefore, the black knight, first of all it was attacked also, but also to cover the h7 square, the knight moved to f6. For the moment being, the knight also attacks the white queen on g4. And now, white played queen g6, which apparently forced black's resignation. Well, the problem is that while at the moment the black knight from f6 guards the h7 square, white is about to eliminate that knight by capturing it with the rook. This is one of those situations when we're more than happy to give up a valuable piece or even a more valuable piece than what it captures in order so that black would no longer protect that key square where a checkmate would about to happen. So what's the moral of the story? Well, for one, be very careful leaving your pieces on unprotected squares. As we saw a number of times in this game, the reason why black was getting in trouble is because their queen was on an unprotected square. And generally, you have to be very careful in opening files when there are discoveries in the air. Discovered checks are perhaps the most powerful tactical elements in chess altogether. The only one, perhaps even more dangerous than that, is a variation of discovery and that would be a double check. So if your opponent has a threat of a discovery, be extremely careful, make sure you either avoid it altogether or prepare for it so at the end of the day you will not lose material. Well, after this very instructive game I'd like to say goodbye for this lesson and be back next week for some more chess ideas. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <music>